whole like this film it it shows us the um the medicalization the bureaucratization and the pathology of trans bodies and so on, but then there's just something coursing through it. It's like a fist in the air, but a ray of light and, you know, a, a, with the children at the end, there's so much hope and utopia in this film. It's, it's so beautiful. And I wanted to ask you, I mean, I think we also see this in your writing over, over the many years, this, this sort of um, very utopian, um, uh, w way of writing that it's you know we'll, we'll show the the bad stuff but there's a way forward and I guess I just want to ask you why did you decide to make this as a film and how did it come to be a film and not say another text or a lecture yeah well thank you so much for watching the film it is a real pleasure to be you know in this festival which until now has been really amazing and a privilege to to be part of it and Honestly, I, if I have to say the truth, I never thought I would make a film. And that uh, some of the people that are in the audience that are my friends and they know me for quite a long time, they know that I never spoke to them about, I mean, I spoke to them about many crazy things in my life, but uh, never about making a film. Because this is something that I, I thought it would be, you know, that I, I, in a sense, I thought that like the uh, cinema was the hegemonic uh, cultural industry and that it would be like very little, uh, political agency for me to make an interesting film. Uh, I n never thought about that. I, I was on the other side. I was collecting images, looking at film, um, using films as critical material for my thinking or whatever, but never thought about making a film. And then um, happened something that w is really unusual, I think, uh, and that I had to, to take position in relation to it. Uh, the French, German TV production company, uh, Arte, came to me and said to me, we have a, already we're working on a film about you, about your life. <laughs> uh, we're making a biopic about your life. We have a film director. I said, oh, interesting. I said, wow, okay. <laughs> Why about my life? I mean, there is nothing. I'm, I'm a writer. So, you know, that's going to be a very boring film. <laughs> and of course, they, they had, already been doing recently films about trans people, right? So they had done a film about Bambi, who's a, a trans, really well-known trans woman in France that kind of uh, became trans in the 1970s, 80s. They had done a film as well about like a, a trans girl and they thought, I guess, that they needed to have like the, you know, the in-between piece that they didn't have, which was like someone middle-aged that was like a, not a female, so was a male trans pe person and that, are, and, and I already knew how the film would be when talking to them. I knew that they had, it was already a narrative that was given and it was there for me, uh, which in a sense kind of repeated the, the medical discourse um, and a very conventional way of thinking a biography as well. Not just the question of, of uh, representing a trans life, but also representing a life as such, which is basically how a life should be set, re represented or, or told, right? Like basically where you've been born and who is your family and then what have you done after that? What is your work and what have you accomplished, right? Which is maybe that's not really important. That's not exactly what a life is about, right? So none of the things that they proposed to me, both I mean, both things kind of really scare me. Uh, so I, I went to Arte to, uh, to see a committee of, uh, of producers to actually tell them, please don't make this film, right? But as I o always say, because it, this is kind of a, an experience that some of the people in the audience might have, is like in a heterosexual relationship, the more you say no, the more they want to do it. So basically, <laughs> basically, like, I was like, it never happened to me before. It's like, don't make this film. We want to do it. <laughs> it's like, don't make this film. Yes, we want. I was like, why not, please? And then so I gave Sorry, them Sorry, it's, it's a good tip for filmmakers out there. If you want to get your films funded. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a possibility. So I was like giving them other ideas. Like, wh why not make an uh, extraordinary film about Michel Foucault? It's like, no, Michel Foucault, that's <laughs> it's not just boring. <laughs> wow, make a film about Monique Bittig. Like, who is Monique Bittig? We don't even know who's this woman. I'm like, okay, well, you need to, to, to update yourself. 
ourselves, guys. Um, and at the certain moment, honestly, as a joke and as a way of, uh, you know, like putting an end to the conversation, I said, in any case, if you want to make a biography of myself, like a biopic of my life, then you're going to have to make the documentary adaptation of Orlando by Virginia Woolf. And that for me was a way of saying, this is the end of the conversation, I'm leaving this room, right? And then suddenly, all of them were like, wow, this is a fantastic idea, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and then someone said, like, but who's going to make this film? And then the director said, well, maybe Paul, <laughs> you know? And I guess, I don't know, but... Uh, I wonder sometimes why I said yes to that, you know? I could have said no, but maybe um, that's maybe interesting about what is philosophy and why, you know, what does it mean to make philosophy today? And maybe it's not exactly, it's not, it doesn't have to be always a, a written form, a book. It could be other things. You, the form can be thought in relation to the question that is being asked, right? So I thought, well, why not, you know? And also, like, not knowing. Not knowing became really important to me. Not knowing how to make a film. Because by not knowing, I, I really had to invent another way of making films, in a sense, right? And then, uh, of course, when I found my, my producers, and Annie Ohion is here, one of my producers that are fantastic, and thank you again, Annie. Um, of course, they immediately asked me, like, well, you said, an, you know, a documentary adaptation of Orlando by Virginia Woolf. So what is a, no a documentary adaptation? And I said, I, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. I made it up during this conversation, right? Um, but of course, what I had an intuition. I, at that moment, I had an intuition. The intuition that, um, first, that fiction, at some point of my, of my life, became more important to me than reality, right? Like basically that I encountered this this book when I was a teenager uh, in literature class. You could pick other books, choose whatever book you wanted from a series of books. And by chance, I actually happened to pick up this book. And then it was called Orlando, a biography. And I, I was born in Spain during the dictatorship. When I was a teenager, Spain was transitioning as well from let's say, dictatorship into, they call it democracy, but in reality was neoliberalism. Um, and there was nothing around in the society where I was living, nothing around that could allow me to imagine my life the way I, I was trying to think it could be, right? At that time, of course, I mean, even the notion of being trans didn't exist, and I never heard the word at that point in my life before. But when I read Orlando, first, like, by the title of the book being a biography, even though it doesn't matter that the book basically starts in the 1500 and it goes up to the 1928. So, it's, I mean, clearly it's not a biography because no one can really live, like, 300 years. And But for me, that I was a teenager, that was, in a sense, a biography. And fiction became more important than reality. In a sense, that book became more important for me than, than the Bible, more important than the Constitution that was being written, more important than any of the, the let's say, uh, the scripted real books. No, I mean, not to say that the Bible is real. <laughs> Excuses. <laughs> but for some people, it's, take, it's taken for granted that it's a, it's a real uh, text or something like that, right? So I, I, I guess that, that also might had influenced the way in which I somehow became a writer, right? because I, I started to live like 80% of my life in fiction and maybe 20% in reality, right? But I guess that that's like a, it's a I, I guess it's a common condition for all of us that, are, that belong to political minorities that in a sense do not have full political existence within reality. So in a sense, uh, political imagination, fiction, becomes really a tool for survival, for liberation, for emancipation, right? So that book was was very important for me at that point. Then I forgot about the book for many years. I mean, but, uh, you know, but the sense that your biography, in a sense, that this narrative 
is there before you. And in a sense that even predefines who could you be, right? Even though that, that narrative is also, even in Virginia Woolf, is very normative in a sense, right? But, but I, I had this intuition within that meeting that basically um, that I was alive, that I, was, I had come out of this, of this book, and that I was surrounded by many other Orlandos that were alive. And then I think that even the, the, the possibility of making the film uh, started to like, take shape in, in front of me. And, and film is a collaborative medium as well, of course. And so can you tell us about your 26 Orlandos? Were they people you knew? Did you do a casting? And how did you work with them? And, and what was it like for you to work so collaboratively as opposed to by yourself? Yeah, that was amazing, actually. I mean, first, of course, there were some Orlandos that I knew I wanted to work with. Like, for instance, Jenny Belair, who's the one of the oldest persons that you see in the film. Um, who's a historical figure in the trans movement in France. So I knew that I wanted to have Jenny in the film. So I called Jenny and I said, like, I'm making this film. Do you want to participate? And, and she said yes from the beginning. And then, um, and also friends, because basically since I didn't know what I was doing at the beginning, and I started to have this intuition as well that I, I wanted the Orlandos to use the language of Virginia Woolf to prevent them from uh, speaking the way we traditionally speak about uh, transitioning. So in a sense that I was again using this fiction and the language of literature and fiction to avoid um, the normative way of uh, speaking about transitioning with the language of uh, psychopathology, the legal language and also and so on. So I knew that it, it was quite difficult at the beginning, for instance, to for any one of them to be able to speak about their own life and then suddenly going to speaking using the words of Virginia Woolf and coming back. So I, I also called some of my friends and I, I said to them, look, I'm, I'm making a film. I have to say that for, for a while I almost kept it in secret because I was embarrassed about making a film. I thought, oh, you know, what, what am I doing? I mean, I'm totally crazy. I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, also in relation to my academic friends, some of which are here and so on, I thought they're gonna think that I'm, I'm just like a stupid making a film, especially because, um, <laughs> because very soon, actually, I, I call it casting, right? Like, so we, I had this intuition, I, uh, we are many Orlandos, <laughs> and of course among my friends, many of the Orlandos are the same age, but I wanted to have like all these you know, this political genealogy of uh, many different of landers of different generations and so on. But I, maybe I thought, maybe I call it casting and I know no one wants to, to play Orlando, you know? And then 100 people answered to this casting. And it was amazing because each of these, uh, I each of them would present themselves as Orlando. I, it was nothing that I had to do about it. It was like basically someone would come and would say, you know, I'm Orlando, <laughs> you know, hello, I'm Orlando. And I, I'm gonna tell you why. Da, 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 da. I was like, okay, serious, this is your Orlando, no way, no discussion. Next one, blah, 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 I'm Orlando, you know? So it was, then suddenly, uh, I also started to think that it was not just my intuition and my relationship to this book, but that something else was happening, right? Um, and of course, then I also decided to work with them in a very particular way, which I think maybe m changed the way in which the film was made uh, in the sense that basically, because I'm not coming from filmmaking, and so I, I guess that no one had, had told me like, you know, the way I, I should be making films. And the only know that the only thing that I know how to do is basically either making books or making a exhibitions or or doing like activist projects. I did all these things at the same time within the film, reading Orlando, for instance, with them as I would read it like with uh, students or with uh, in an activist group, and using the activist method methodology with them, right? So basically, like uh, making decisions about like what are the parts of the book that we will be taking for each of them and we will do like long conversations and interviews with them and then decide with them which w which parts of their lives they want to represent and why 
And then the whole film that you see finally is really scripted. It's very scripted. So there is nothing that it looks very like a, you know casual that they're saying these things. But as you can imagine, no one casually can really quote Virginia Woolf, <laughs> right? <laughs> so it, everything ended up to be really like very written down, and and they were extremely like generous. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm so grateful to each of them. And if there are any questions, please just raise your hand. I don't think we have a mic tonight, so I'll just get you to... Oh, we do. Fantastic. Yes, at the back there in the white shirt. Thank you for the question. Well, first, I have to say that, of course, I didn't think about the at the beginning about the question of the language of the book. For, I mean, I read the book in Spain when I was a child, but in an English class, basically. So we had like this kind of a translated book with with both languages. But then at that point, I didn't think about like, what am I gonna, how am I gonna do this, right? Then you have to know that in France, basically, and working with a n national TV, public TV as Arte, it's almost it's impossible to make the film in, in English. I mean, it was really, it would be crazy to make the film in English. And also, I mean, people will have to speak like Virginia Woolf, imagine, I mean, it would be like really difficult. So I I almost make the decision from the beginning to make the film in, Fran in, f in French, you know, because we I made it fully in Paris. Um, I had a very little budget, so very soon. I thought at a certain moment that I might go to England and maybe try to, my, my producers is, producer is there so we were thinking about maybe we will go to Knoll to the castle of a of Vita and maybe try to film there but it was extremely expensive and we didn't have really the money to you know to do to do more than one trip so it was very difficult so I, I decided to make it in French and then the decision was as well which translation to use right so I ended up using like a 19 really 29 translations so the first really re the first very first translation because was the closest to the uh to let's say this kind of highly baroque uh precious language of virginia Woolf, and i wanted to to keep that for the for the film so we were working with with that um and then funny enough like this year i i went to talk about the film without presenting the film yet, but to talk about a film at a um, Virginia Woolf colloquium, or just like conference, right? And then many British authors and specialists in Virginia Woolf were there, and I they asked me, like, but what is the language of the film? And I said, like, well, I made a film in French, and they were like, my God, for them it was the worst. Yeah. It was it was like in French. <laughs> I mean, this is worse than transition, you know. Anything it was like it is like, is this, uh, uh, you know, contra nature? It's like and anti nature. It's impossible that this is Orlando in, in French. And I thought that was it was fun for me, you know, to think that even the language is being fully changed and it's the worst language that you can imagine for the <laughs> British is French, <laughs> you know. I thought it, that was that was fun. But of course, if I wanted to work with the, you know, like 26 Orlandos in France, the only way of making that was, was in French because of the working with the teenagers, working with the, the people that are 75. I mean, <laughs> if I come to them with the, the British version of Orlando, I think that I, I will have no film <laughs> at the end, right? <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's a, a, an important question, an interesting question, absolutely. Hi, Paul. Uh, thank you for this film. And uh, the first thing I want to say is that I can assure you that your friends in academia are green with envy that you have a film. <laughs> uh, you know, scandalized. Um, my question is that is, do you see the um, your attitude towards medicine and psychiatry changing over the course of the film. It starts with more of a critique and satire of psychiatric power, but then that really extraordinary scene at the end where the like stitching of the 
And that, is that you? Are you the oh, yeah, totally. you are the surgeon? Yeah. So oh, yeah, how does totally. <laughs> talk about the, is there an evolution or a transition in the relationship of the film to medicine? Yeah, that's a super important question. Well, I think that the the film is very critical both to the normative discourse within, I would say, psychiatry, but also psychoanalysis as well, and and the medical discourse on on trans and gender issues as a whole, right? Nevertheless, uh, within this particular context, within this society, transitioning means engaging with, I mean, without, almost without choice, engaging one way or another one with the psychiatric discourse and with medical practices. Even if it's by saying no to them, Right, that's also engaging with them, especially wh when you're trans. In a very different way, let's say, like a, uh, it could be the case, for instance, for what we usually traditionally would call homosexuals in the late 19th century, that would also engage with the medical discourse. This is not the case anymore, right? So that that relationship certainly is changing, and hopefully will change. But today, this is uh, still the case that we, we have to engage in, in different ways. The same thing that we, we have to engage also legally in a very different way that, for instance, uh, people that are considered to be homosexuals, right? And that is like, a, 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 uh, whereas I do not believe in identity as something that is ingrained or something that is given or whatever, but I, I do believe in, in the ways in which, or belief, I do uh, understand the ways in which identity is socially constructed differently in the case, for instance, of queerness or in the case of transitioning, right? So that, that critical engagement with, with medicine is there for, for the whole film. But what I think is changing by the end of the film is the position, is like the, you know, you, we are not anymore at the position of being just a patient. So I think that, that that scene, I mean, each of the scenes of the film are a little bit thought as almost political rituals. Um, the scene of a pharmacal liberation scene, or basically like transforming this waiting room uh, in a club where basically we're like exchanging hormones and, um, by the end of the film, we are all of us collectively at the position of operating history, right? I'm, so I'm not exactly, even though I'm using, let's say, surgery to talk about that, I'm not just speaking about medicine, right? Uh, even though the surgery scene as I was explaining today before at the, at the talk that we had, is basically, I, I would say, is one of the, the fundamental elements in the grammar. I mean, from the beginning of the history uh, of constructing the representation of transness, the scene of surgery is absolutely fundamental within that grammar, right? So I knew, I had no choice as well. I knew that that scene of surgery would be there. But uh, the the political position of all of us has have changed f by then. In relation to the film, I mean, interesting enough, that scene is also, not all the scenes have been made or shot exactly in the same order that you see it, of course, because this is, this is a film and it was edited and so on. But that particular scene is really one of the last scenes of the, of the film that I film, really. Among other things, because it was it was quite difficult to find a hospital during the COVID and so on, and you know to really like have this is a real hospital with a real operating table and so on. But but it was also at the end because I I guess that the the film is very much about the filming the process of a political emancipation of all of us, right? 
And I guess that for all of us that we were at that particular scene, um, it was a really empowering moment because many of us ha have passed through that operating table or we, we will do it later. Um, but I think it's what is critical there is that it is even though the the representation is surgery, uh, what is being operated is history, which is a completely different thing, right? And therefore, it's not about medicine anymore, in a sense, right? I, it's, I, all the all the power of medicine has been taken away, and also, I mean, this is something I'm, we don't really have the time to speak about many other things, and it's something maybe more personal, but. Um, I I had been recently, you know, th have gone recently through surgery, and I thought that it's ridiculous that we keep thinking s that surgery could be fully understood through medicine. It's such a it's, it's ridiculous because uh, something much bigger is happening for each of us that are going through surgery, and I'm not just speaking about like trans. Uh, transitioning or you know but any any surgery that implies opening up the body transforming the body for survival or for transforming the body in many other ways i think that in in other cultures this has many other meanings which in the west has been progressively captured reduce almost strangle and and miniaturize into the medical discourse Whereas basically each of us that had gone through, I'm, I've been speaking with many different people that, I mean, the, the people that participated in the scene, of course, but many other people that have seen the film and everything and that we started like speaking about surgery, right? And we thought how, um, how important it is for us to understand that surgery cannot be fully defined, captured, explained by medical discourse and the way medical discourse is understanding a particular operation as either fixing an organ or replacing this for that or removing that or you know something else is happening there right it's happening and and maybe this something else precisely has to do with operating history right like with it's, it's not just the individual body that is operated or that is having surgery, but I think it's that's a, such a this will this, I don't know. It's, we will need a full parliament to <laughs> really solve this question. <laughs> uh, do we have time for one more? Yes. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, well, I realized when when I started making the film that I had a, a huge archive of images that I had been collecting all my life, both um, what I call these necropolitical images of us, which is basically the, the history of a normalizing binary gaze on non-binary, trans, deviant, whatever people you want to call it, like <laughs> us, right? So I had like that history, and that I also had uh, a utopian archive, you know, like other like images that emancipating images or images that at a certain moment had had been useful for me to be able to uh, understand who I am or fabricate who I am or also collectively, right? So I had to go back to these images immediately and like watch again these films and understand, try to understand why do I like this image? Why? And sometimes uh, you could see many of these references within the within, within the film. I mean, I had to go back immediately. Like, for instance, Godard is very present in the in the film. I always I think that Godard had solved many many of the questions that I was trying to ask myself in relation to fiction. For instance, this relationship between fiction and documentary, or um, or even the relationship between text and image, right? Uh, or even how I would be present in the film, that I knew immediately I'm, I'm really, I'm very uncomfortable when I'm being filmed. Uh, I don't like to be in the image myself. And I knew my, my way of being in the film will be through the voice. So that like sound is, is super important for me in all films. And um, 
then Pasolini also became super important. Like for instance, uh, writers that have been have tried to make like ridiculous films because I mean trying to adapt like for instance like um, Greek theater plus the camera and plus I mean you know like all kinds of. Uh, these kind of ridiculous projects that are, end up being amazing in the case of Pasolini. So I, I went back to that as well. And of course, like all the underground queer trans, you know, tradition from the 70s that I, I've been like uh, um, feeding myself with, right? So I had to go back as well to all those, like Ulrike Ottinger that had done her own um, queer Orlando or freak Orlando. Um, even though it's very different what I, of what I tried to do, but it was interesting to see her resolution of the same problem. But many other people, like Jack Smith's images, uh, even Warhol at some point in another, Almodovar's images, of course, because I'm from Spain and I grew up with them. Um, Shuli Shang, because I've been working with her like m many times and even writing for her. So I, I already had, I, I realized that I also had that, that kind of uh, utopian archive uh, that I could go back to, and um, so uh, saying this is just to say that I. It's not just that when you write books, there are no images. On the contrary, I mean, y when you write, there are many images. But um, I'm ha and I have always worked with images. For instance, when working on architecture, we're working. I work a lot with images, even though may you don't might might not see it in the book, but. Um, so yeah, and and then I guess that there is something interesting as well in the sense that I started to work a lot with the kids, with like, you know, many of the the people that you see in the film, sometimes some of them were like 12 when we started working and then they, they kind of grew up through the process of making the film and they're like 15 or 16 or whatever, but they are teenagers. So when making the film, there was a moment in which basically I knew that I was making the film not just for the kids, but with them and in a kind of a playful, um, almost childish way, right? And that kind of, it was a, r it was a relief when I, I make that decision. Because at some point I, I had like all these expectations of, uh, and of course I was making the film with very, very little money. So, you know, I mean, it was imp many of the things that I would have thought about were impossible, right? But Working on on this childish, punky, you know, aesthetics of um, DIY became uh, it became very productive in a sense because everything became possible. We were like, okay, we need a. I, I won't be able to go, of course, to to go to the sea and film uh, on a boat. Okay, but let's make a boat <laughs> with whatever we find, right? Um, and so many of the images were constructed this way. In a in a very low profile, playful way. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Paul, thank again you. for the film thank and for you. being here. Thank you, and thank you for your questions. <laughs> <laughs>